All right, recording here Friday morning. Excellent episode coming at you. I think the names say it all. Devin McCourty, James White, both back on the podcast for the first time together, which I got to tell you was not on purpose. The plan was actually just to have James White here Friday and then set up an episode next Monday with Devin, who has been making the media rounds, and split that up, get ahead, kick my feet up, have a weekend, continue to work on longer stories for the Herald, which are going to come out in the next couple of weeks. And then we had a timing conflict, and I said, you know what? In the immortal words of the immortal Michael Scott, why don't we just gangbang this thing and get out of here? So we have Devin and James here for you today. I assure you I did not say those words to them. Uh, they were fantastic. You missed them. Uh, I love connecting when I can with either one of them, let alone both at the same time. And so this was a really great conversation about basically everything you would want to know. Going inside the Patriots building, talking about Drake May, OTAs and what to expect, and then minicamp where these guys had so many teammates. They came through Foxborough. Some good, some bad, um, some less than bad. And how soon you could tell whether these guys had it or not. And they'll tell you what I should be looking for and then relay to you throughout OTAs and mini camp. And when you can come to training camp and see for yourself whether or not guys like Javon Baker or Layden Robinson or Jalen Polk and, of course, Drake May have it or not. So this is insight, uh, 20 years of experience, very close to it. In the building, Super Bowls, captains, all that. You know them. You love them. We're going to get to them in a second. But first, uh, a small spiel from me, then mailback questions, and then the back end of this mail fan with Jordan Boss, who for uh, the second time since we've opened the mail fan segment where you ask me a question, you donate to Boston Children's, and you get your own segment. Uh, it's going to wrap things up. I just want to say thank you because – it hit me this week is life as far as the Patriots go kind of slow down a little bit, right? Like there, there's nothing faster than the final stretch heading into the draft. The draft itself is a marathon. And then you sit with your own thoughts and your grades and you do a podcast and you finally breathe. And so on the process of finally breathing, it hit me that this podcast has been going on for a little over two years. And we've had so much growth, whether it comes in from the views or listening or forget all of the numbers. Just how about having Devin and James where – I love talking to either one of them individually, but both at the same time, and then getting feedback from you as to who you want to hear from. So as we get old stories from these guys, as we hand out grades with Doug and Giardi, as we dance around dick jokes with the guys from The Ringer before the draft, we're getting close to what the best version of this podcast is going to be. And I think it's just going to be something that you know it when you hear it. I'm going to feel it when I'm in the middle of it. And to get closer, because of your support, which helps us grow, along the way and, and reach more people and get better with your feedback, as well as the guests that we have, um, just just means so much to me. So I wanted to say thank you. And if you feel so inclined to say thank you back, please leave me a rating or a review. I think it's been six weeks since we've had one. And my pitch is always the same, so I should probably change this up. Uh, you've committed, I would estimate, about 45 minutes at least to this podcast episode. If you have another single minute, just leave a review. Just give us five star, four star, whatever it's going to be. We take all the feedback, good and bad. So please give us the feedback if you have some, again, with a rating or review, preferably on Apple, but also wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, and so to again say thank you, we're going to lead with the mailbag and then get to Devin and James. And I promise this is something where I almost always break this promise. <laughs> I said this is going to be quick. And then I finish at the end of a three-minute monologue in a conversation that's supposed to be with another person. We are going to go... Rapid fire with these mailbags because, of course, you want to get to Devin and James. Uh, and they were great. So here we go. This is from Twitter this week. A couple of days delayed. Apologies for folks who wanted these answers right away. Here they are. Aaron, quote, are the Pats still seeking your true number one wide receiver? Aaron, I got to tell you, I think that boat has sailed. And it's not because the Patriots just gave up and wants to sail away from them. It's just the nature of the market. I think the last chance, and I could be wrong, but was Brandon Ayuk or Debo Samuel, who reportedly – the 49ers wanted a high first round pick that could have landed them Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. or Roma Dunze so that they could just trade away the proven receiver for the supposed can't miss prospect and just keep marching on to the Super Bowl. That obviously didn't happen. So they're going to run it back around Brock Purdy's contract for one more year, hope to resign Brandon Ayuk. I wouldn't rule out a possibility that this happens maybe in the summer. Let's say Ricky Pearsall, who obviously San Francisco just drafted, just completely balls out. Maybe. Maybe then they're more open to trading Debo, who I think is a more likely trade target for anyone. But for now, the Patriots, like, th those are the names that are out there. We talked about T. Higgins. You don't use a franchise tag 
unless you want to keep him. That's the beauty of the franchise tag for a team. He's going to stay put. So will the 49ers. I think everyone's just going to be in wait and see mode, maybe until next offseason. Pats fan Kevin, quote, what's a scoop at running back? Feels like an area where there's usually three or four viable names in the roster, but currently there's only two uh, that feel like realistic roster locks. I was very surprised there wasn't a day three pick here. Do you feel a veteran addition coming? Yeah, possibly. Uh, I, I think they have indicated they're higher on Kevin Harris than you are. And I think that's not necessarily earned, but obviously they're on Kevin Harris more than you or I uh, are. That being said, I wouldn't rule out a veteran addition. I think it might be health related. There are three other backs behind Kevin Harris, giving them six deep at the position. And this is something that we've talked about a lot on the pod. Rushing success is not so much the guys who's carrying the ball. It's how the offensive line performs in front of him, and then how many defenders are on the other side of the line of scrimmage. So the Patriots go, if we can do our job up front or create favorable boxes uh, through formations or motion or any kind of scheme, then we can run the ball, whether it's Stevenson, who's still a good runner, or Antonio Gibson, who I think is an improvement over Ezekiel Elliott. But if either one of those guys goes down, absolutely, uh, in training camp or the preseason or early season, they're going to they're gonna sign a veteran back. Doug. With the draft in the books and looking at the roster, what remaining free agents should the Patriots be targeting to fill the roster holes? So it's funny that I waited a day for this because the Patriots had two roster spots when I was writing Wednesday going, hmm, what's their next major move going to be? Is it a Bailey Zappi trade? Is it cutting Juju Smith-Schuster? Could it be signing an offensive tackle? And then they signed an edge rusher, and then they signed Joey Sly, a kicker. So there go the two free roster spots. They have no roster spots available, again, as we record here Friday morning. What I would say, though, is if training camp starts slowly, like last year, when it was apparent, not just to me, but to coaches I spoke to about this, where Riley Reef, uh, without pads on in the first couple of days of camp, got demoted from first team right tackle to second team and then later moved to guard because, in the words of someone I spoke to, if we had 10 reps of pass rush between Riley Reef and Josh Uche, Uche would win nine and the last one might be a tie. So my point in bringing that up is if uh, Chuck Sikorafor or Caden Wallace or Calvin Anderson is not ready at left tackle, Bakhtiari and maybe Charles Leno would be two names that I would watch for because those are proven left tackles, not cross your fingers like a Okorafor and Caden Wallace. Maybe they can do it. Maybe they can't. And guys who are available, Bakhtiari, obviously, with Green Bay, neither in the eyes of the front office are going to be your starters you know, for the whole season. But at that point, you just need a body. And I don't think the Patriots can afford to wait like they did with Riley Reef and Calvin Anderson, emergency trading for Tyron Wheatley Jr. and Vidarian Lowe in late August. I think it would be early August if they see they're in trouble because you just, you just, you can't, you would hope, you would think, you would pray, suffer the same fate at tackle as they did last year. And really, if we're being honest, at right tackle the year before. Gary, two part question. Quote uh, One, will any other player sign an extension before week one? B, if so, who is that player? Uh, I don't see it. So I don't really have a player here for you. And if there is a player, you know, you're looking, the 21 draft class just recently became uh, extension eligible. That's why Christian Barmore got done. Uh, no one in 22 is available or eligible for an extension right now. So Stevenson's the last one. And maybe they get some sort of team-friendly deal with him. But the running back market is so, I don't I don't know how I put this. It's It's not fragile, but it's, it's difficult to navigate or predict based on the deals that the top veterans got this year, Josh Jacobs and Saquon Barkley, and how Stevenson might view himself. If he wants a bag, um, then he's not going to get an extension. If he really wants to stay and take like an Uche level team friendly deal, then yeah, maybe he gets one. But I, I just don't see that happening. I think he's a guy who will want to hit the market. Um, though he said on the record he wants to be here for countless years. It's just it doesn't seem like good team business or a number that's going to be, um, you know high enough for Stevenson just to take before, you know, he could hit the open market and have all of his options open. Dan, do you have confidence that the new offensive staff will be able to organize a competitive offense? Define confidence. <laughs> like I, um, I don't remember what I gave Alex Van Pelt for a grade. And, and I think whatever that grade is, has been bumped up by, you know, half a letter right now, based on things I've, I've learned and, and spoken to people close to him and who have worked with him before. I think the scheme will be simple and complimentary enough, but there's a real concern on my end as far as how many other teams would have signed some of these other assistants or, in fact, let some of these assistants walk from Cleveland or New York 
where you look at now offensive line and running backs for the Patriots, um, you know, that they really had competition for. It's the same thing for a player. If you're the only one bidding for a free agent or looking to draft someone, there might be a reason for that. doesn't mean that you're wrong and everyone else was right, but there's just a lot of coaches and assistants who fit into that category. So I don't know, like C plus. And that has a lot to do with Alex Van Pelt and a little bit more to do with Ben Bacadu than I expected. But if he's just focused on the quarterbacks, not running an offense, not leading a room, not leading a team, that might be a much better role than I expected when he was first hired. So it really comes down to those two guys. Uh, overlapping questions. We got two more. Uh, the first one is the is the overlap. Chris and Mayor Musings. Who do you see as a starting left tackle? Is the transition from right tackle to left tackle as easy to make it seem? And Mayor Musings brought up Calvin Anderson. So right now, based on what the Patriots have told us, I would say, and Elliot Wolf answered this question himself. So this is not a projection. This is what he said. Either he was lying or they've already changed their minds if it's not uh, Chukwumu Okorafor. That's it. They're going to give a guy who was the Steelers' starting right tackle the last three years and has only played left tackle in the NFL during the preseason a chance to be their starter uh, week one. Now, they won't have pads on until the second week of training camp. So he can be there, and you can glean some, as we just talked about with Riley Reef, how well you're holding up against speed rushes, or, or are you executing your assignments, how's your contact balance, all these things without pads, but he'll be the guy week one. Calvin Anderson is someone who has had uh, many more starts at left tackle, but was more of a swing guy in Denver, who we just talked about players that teams don't want. Uh, he fit that category a year ago when he signed in New England. So I don't think, based on last year's tape, when he missed all the camp and was sick, and there will be more on that coming out, I think, in the next few weeks and months. And I'll leave it there. Uh, it's his health. It's his business. But I don't think you can pencil him at left tackle. I don't think it's fair to judge him what he did at right tackle, not having a whole summer and being thrown out there against the Eagles and the Dolphins. Um, but I think what they really hope is that it's Caden Wallace is the answer to your question. Now, last one from Epri. Quote, you mentioned recently, meaning me, Elliot Wolf spent wisely in free agency. Aside from re-signing players, which is a good thing. Uh, no, That was his parenthetical, not mine. No money was spent to improve. Even if it was just the offensive line upgraded in free agency, would, uh, it would have allowed for more maneuverability in the draft. Why are you so high on Elliott Wolf? So let me say this. I am an Elliott Wolf believer. I've told you this. I've written it. It doesn't mean I see Super Bowls in the future uh, or the playoffs in two seasons. But from everything I learned talking to GMs like John Schneider, who won a Super Bowl, Jason Light, who won a Super Bowl, Nick Casario, we can all see what he's doing down in Houston now that he's finally has full control over a roster, uh, Dave Ziegler, and even Brian Gutekunst, who worked with Elliott for years and years and years in Green Bay, all of them gave Elliott rave reviews. And I get that they know their words are going on the record. So no one wants to be a dick in public, especially with someone that you have to, at some point, maybe negotiate with, talk trade with, or otherwise do business. That said, everything I heard about Elliot on that level with the GMs or scouts underneath him, people who used to work with him, uh, people who knew him in Green Bay, was just sterling stuff. Now, in my own view, I would take issue with the description you just had there. They didn't make any effort to improve. Jacoby Brissett immediately brings some competency, some organization, some leadership to that quarterback room. He would have been. Far and away, the Patriots' best quarterback last year, given what we saw, okay? They also upgraded a running back with Antonio Gibson. And you could make an argument that Austin Hooper is better than what Mike Kosicki gave them. And even if you don't want to make that argument, what I would say is there was no baseline guarantee. There was no copying and pasting the 2023 defense and a roster and just into 2024. Kyle Duggar could have left in free agency. Mike Onwenu could have left in free agency. Hunter Henry could have gone. Josh Uche could have walked out that door. And Franny Jennings. So there's a there was a much lower floor to this team than we will ever see because those guys were re-signed. All of which were re-signed to team-friendly or just perfectly reasonable deals. Like Uche was an incredible steal. And I'm not here to just applaud Elliott at every single move. I give the whole offseason a B. But what I see is discipline in free agency where they pursued a receiver like you should pursue a Calvin Ridley, but at some point came to stop. And Doug Kide shared this with you last week, earlier this week. That might be a bad deal in Tennessee for Calvin Ridley. So I see someone who prioritizes the right players internally. I see someone who has a limit in free agency, which you don't see with a lot of GMs, especially GMs 
who are working on an, an addition, uh, an audition. And then in the draft, takes the quarterback, which we all wanted. We all saw was the most reasonable outcome. And I didn't love the Caden Wallace pick, but getting a receiver and then an offensive tackle and another receiver, that's how you draft. Premium positions. Because if you hit, there's no better value than having a player at a premium position who is a high-end talent on a ridiculous cost-controlled contract. So all of the decisions I've seen the process as sound, I think they've landed in a good place. Maybe you want upgrades here or there. I'm not here to argue. But as far as free agency, if it wasn't Calvin Ridley, okay, what other receiver did you want to see them sign? Because there were names that we threw out there. Marquise Brown might have been it. Offensive tackle Tyron Smith was never going to come here. Jonah Williams, totally fair gripe. I, I, I would have pursued Jonah Williams. They felt differently. They didn't want to do it. Um, and that's why it's not an A, it's not an A minus, it's not a B plus. It's a solid B for me. So of all of those things, that's why I am a, a believer. So uh, that's about it. And we are going to get to James and Devin. One last thank you and request if you have a minute, please rate and review. And until then, enjoy this from Devin McCourty and James White. Well, let me tell you, soon enough, we are going to turn our attention to the Celtics and Bruins because they're getting in on the playoff action. And so can you with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where right now you can win up to 100 times your money with as few as four correct picks with basketball, hockey, and other sports on Prize Picks. And I'll tell you, look, I like Prize Picks for baseball too. The Red Sox just started up. They're playing the Mariners, the A's. I put a little money down and I got a lot more money back. So download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. I did the same. Again, download the app today. Use code CLNS at Prize Picks for a first deposit match up to $100 and you can do the same. Basketball, hockey, and baseball. We got a lot to do until the draft and you can find it all at Prize Picks. All right, come back in time with us. It is uh, summer 2017. James White is a big Super Bowl hero. Bill does not care about that, so we have blitz pickup in training camp. Devin versus James. I need an answer on the count of three. Who wins the head-to-head, one-on-one blitz pickup? <laughs> Devin McCourty, James White, one, two, three, go. James, I'm not a blitz. Yeah, he's not a blitzer. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get on here and uh, your post career be like, man, I used to do this. And then, uh, my blitzing was weak. I need to be unblocked. Uh, yeah, until 18, right? Till Flo finally cut all of you loose. Like, we, we saw you a little bit of time in that final Super Bowl run, but you just, uh, you, you were out on that and come camp. Yeah, I mean, if I'm unblocked, I used to tell Flo, draw that thing up. <laughs> Let's do it one way all game, and then one one or two times, send me. They're not going to expect it. I get a free sack. If I'm not getting a free sack, I'm good. That's the one thing about me, though. If I get to the quarterback, I'm not going to be like the rest of these slaps that run full speed in there and then miss. If I got to the quarterback, I was going to get a sack. Does that check out, James? That checks out, man. That's He's smart, man. There's a lot of these other guys get a little too excited when they get to the quarterback. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, what do I do with my hands when I get here? You know, a kid going to approach like a, a dog or something. You just didn't expect to get that close. That's the best, worst thing about Pasha. I remember we played Lamar Jackson and Chase Winovich. We talked about it all, all week. Like, you, you're not going to run in there and sack this guy. Him and Uche run in there, and they're like, man, he's so quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we talked about that all week, guys. Slow down. He's going to make you miss. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate both of you coming on. We're, we got a lot uh, to talk about here today, so I want to dive right into it. Especially, Devin, you took a train. Were you coming from New England today? I know you said you got it back home in Jersey this morning. Yeah, I was, but I wasn't in uh, Foxborough for this trip. This was a charity thing. I was in uh, in Boston. Oh, good stuff. Uh, thanks for stopping by and saying hello. I'm just down the street. Not a big deal. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, but you you were recently visited with Drod, and there are a lot of stories now. The draft is over. OTAs are coming up. We're talking to guys like you would sometimes once or twice a week. Hey, what do you think of the new program? Yada, yada. The focus is on what's going inside the building. Uh, murals are being talked about, messages. So just from your last visit to the building and Gerard, like take us as best you can inside what that looks like now under new leadership and with basically a roster that's already put together. Yeah, I think the first thing, I think it, it, it was cool just seeing the different changes they made inside the building. I think I think no matter what, like new regimes, like you want to you want to kind of put your mark on it. You want guys to feel like, hey, we're coming into a new era, because usually no matter whether you step up and you're already there or you're a brand new coach, you're usually coming into a situation that needs some type of change, whatever you want to call it. So um, I got to see the mural, which I think there's it's a bigger deal 
uh, than than people make it. I think I think teams have different things. I've gotten to see that now, right? Being you know retired and doing media, I go in different teams' buildings, and it's all different kind of things. But I think New England has been such like a closed door type of place that everybody's like, I heard there's a new mural in there, and it represents <laughs> this. And I think the mural, I think it's cool. Like it's it's seeing some past legends jerseys and stuff that are up there. And it's this young kid who is dreaming to be a Patriot. And I think it fits, I think what they're trying to build there. I think it fits Mayo. I think it, it's just a new regime. And I think it was a pretty cool idea and concept that they came up with it. And I think the coolest thing is the artist is right from Boston. He's from New England, diehard Patriots fan, grew up a Patriots fan, never spent much time in Gillette growing up as a kid, but always was a fan. So I think that, I think that, symbolizes what they're trying to go for. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. So James, you and I were talking off air. You have not connected as much as Devin has with kind of the new regime, all the changes, except for Ted Harper. Somehow you connected with the team nutritionist <laughs> and that's your only the link. Together. <laughs> yeah, so James is doing his own thing out in the Midwest, but I just want to get your perspective because with that distance, not only just like the physical space, you know, of where you are in Illinois, right? Yep, in Illinois. But the time that you've been away from the game and the organization a little bit longer than Devin has, what do you make when you read and see things on Twitter of just all of these changes, whether it's mural related or not? I mean, I, I think it's pretty cool. I think for anybody who's been walking into the same building year after year and seeing the same stuff, you want to see, you know, something new, something that gets you excited to show up to work. You know, obviously Mayo has been there as a player, as a coach. He's seen, you know, a lot of different things. He's coached, he's played. He's going to use his experience to help change things to the way you know, he wants to do it. He wants to put his own imprint on it with Robin, like we've been seeing in the media, like we were talking about before we got on air. You typically never hear anybody else's name come from within the building, but you hear, you know, Robin's name. And she's a person who was very active in the community work. And I think that mural kind of speaks to, speaks volumes to what, you know, she's done outside of the building. And she's trying to, you know, make that a part of, you know, the football organization, which it has been, but you don't necessarily hear that talked about from the coaching staff point of view. So I think that's, a unique aspect and a unique spin they put on it. So the reason I brought up Robin, uh, Devin, to James off air was I was reading about these new slogans that have an asterisk in the corner. Did you did you see any of that when you're in there? No, I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't pay attention. Okay. To <laughs> well, the, the reason I brought up, it was in the story at Cam Wolf from the NFL Network, and we'll skip mm -hmm. over this, but there was an explanation that the asterisk means or represents the North Star, which in her sense was it was something that's always moving, but we're always going to chase. And my first thought was, the North Star is a little more famous for being fixated in the sky, and it then becomes a joke that you have to explain. But just like James hit on, the openness of more people are involved. They're going to try something new. I think you'll see it with the players, with the coaches, just like a play call. They're going to land where they want to. It just mm -hmm. might take a little bit of time. But I, I've been very curious about the asterisk because it's like <laughs> – Well, I will, say, I will say Mayo uses that phrase, the North Star, a lot. And oh, okay. He, he always talks about – the North Star being whatever we're ultimately trying to get to of whether it's points allowed on defense, like whatever we were talking about, he he would reference and use that. Mm -hmm. um, so when you say North Star, I have no idea, uh, asterisk or whatever that is, but <laughs> the North Star and what that represents, I've heard Mayo speak about that multiple times, like coaching and uh, from his viewpoint of, of what he thinks that means, I've heard him use that. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll revisit the story or ask around, and I think they're actually going to do a media tour, which might be the furthest 180 that you could oh, have wow. in Bill's time. Yeah, Drod has mentioned, and uh, taking us around, showing us what was new. This <laughs> might be later on, so I'll, I will report back to, to both of you here on the podcast. <laughs> um, but you mentioned the coaching staff. Deb, you dropped this week that, like, Drod had raised the possibility of you joining. James, I know you've answered the same question, even if it was just theoretical. Let's say you guys got to take the job, and it wasn't the insane hours that it is. I'm curious – What's one change or tweak or idea, understanding what the building was and the program was and what you think it should be or be part of that you would have pushed on day one of this theoretical job as an assistant? James, you go first. Uh, for me, it's tough. It's, you get so used to and adjusted to, <laughs> to the to the current state. But I don't say you know, I wasn't on too many special teams when I played, but I know a lot of the guys that were on special teams getting more time to get ready, you know, pre-practice because – Sometimes you have like 15, 20 minutes, jump out of meeting, you know, get dressed, get tape, try and warm up really quickly, get out on the field. So giving guys a little bit more time to get your mind right, get settled in, maybe look over your plays and all that before you get out there and get ready to go for practice. I think that's one big thing that I would change. But you know, everything else I thought was, you know, fairly standard for 
you know, when it comes to day-to-day operations. You know, you're going to meet a ton. You're going to walk through a ton. Just mm-hmm. giving guys a little bit more time to get ready to go out there, you know, and practice at a high level. And that was always a thing. Like, that was like <laughs> James knows. We sat in cabinet <laughs> meetings all the time with Bill and trying to discuss, all right, how much is enough time? And then it would be perfect. And then one coach would go over his meeting time. That would then make the special teams go, coach go over his meeting. And it would just mess up every other day. It would be you know, unknown. Um, but I, honestly, I think for the most part, they've done a lot of the things. Because I think for me, like I've gotten to know Mayo pretty closely. So we used to always talk about different things um, that could be done differently. And I think because Mayo was a captain for so long, he was always involved in the things that players like. So I think the biggest thing is I think being more collaborative on a dip on a lot of different things. I think that is huge. And, you know, talking to Slate, I think that's a big part of of the reason why Slate is there is I think he's, he's a connective tissue to everything, right? He can, he can be the guy that talks to people upstairs in the front office, the players, the coaches, the, uh, the staff that are, are there to, to help the support staff that are there to help the players. Um, so I think that is the biggest thing that I would have said of, Hey, how do we make this where more people can do what they do best and more people can kind of learn how to lead. I think with Bill, you had a leader that was there for so long. It's just people naturally came in and tried to be him, but there's no blueprint to that. And I think now, they have a lot of people trying to create that blueprint to be successful, to be a leader. And they're all trying to work together to get to that because I think you have to, when you lose such a, a strong figurehead in the building, like that was there for 24 years, you can't just say, Hey, Gerard, go be Bill. Like that's impossible. You need a lot of people to kind of fill those roles. It's funny you mentioned connected tissue. Cause that's also what Bill was too, right? Like the guy who was the head of the front office, the head of the coaching yeah. staff, I assume he wasn't with Ted making the meals, but okaying at least like what kind of (laughs) days you guys had before practice or not at all, you know? So like that, you need more players or people like that to kind of bring the the departments together because we can say collaboration all we want, but what does that look like in practice and who's leading or initiating that collaboration? Have you, uh, have you talked to Reverend Slate lately? Can you give us an update more either, either you guys like what he's been up to in his new role? Cause it sounds perfect for him is what you just described. Yeah. I mean, that was my, when I went up there, For most of the time I was there, I was just in the office with Gerard and Slate. And honestly, like it it was it was a little bit about what they're doing. But I mean, we all been we've known each other since, you know, my rookie year in 2010. So a lot of it was just like catching up and and talking, talking trash. And uh, I think the the unique thing is for both of those guys is you were in something for so long and now they're both in brand new roles. So I think both of them are like. Man, I'm handling a lot of things that have nothing to do with football. And that's every coach I've ever talked to when they go from being an assistant to a head coach or for Slate being a player to now being, you know, coach slash everything else. And in between, um, it's the how many things we deal with that don't necessarily on paper help us go win a football game but it helps in the grand scheme of things. Like we were talking, he was like, we're like, we're talking about childcare. We're talking about uh, the weight room and this thing and that thing. He was like, like, we haven't even gotten to the three technique, the wide like (laughs) the wide receiver stance or the new kickoff. We haven't done ball. So that was, that to me, it was, uh, was fun getting there to talk to them about that because I've heard, you know, being back at Rutgers in college. And I remember when, uh, Chris Ash took over as a head coach and he was like, I put out fires all day. Like I don't get to watch ball to the end of the day. Um, so I think that has been pretty unique for both of them being into that. So uh, it's fun being able to be there. And and I think for me now being in media, same thing with James is you learn and see so many things from like a you step back and you can just watch and enjoy the game of football. So I get to talk to them about conversations I have with like my coworkers, like Jason Garrett to me has been a guy that has I've learned a ton from because the organization he was in was the Dallas Cowboys, everything, all eyes on you, <laughs> decision making, all the things that he would look at and review. So whenever I get a chance to, to sit down with Gerard, I just like to pass on that knowledge and tell him the different things I've learned. So um, I always try to do that, whether it's in person or if we're catching up on the phone or anything like that. But um, he never he doesn't come to me to help be the head coach of the Patriots. I don't have those answers. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, not to bust on your guy, but have you shared any clapping techniques that Jer- uh, Jason might <laughs> pass on to anyone else? He, he got a lot of love in Twitter spaces when you were playing for just his constant on the sideline. <laughs> you wear that? It's just always this. 
down 30, this. Up 30, this. Hey, you got to keep it the same, man. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, one real quick thing, because you mentioned putting out fires, and this isn't a fire, but it, it's not to make you know light of a rookie being anything more than a rookie. But when you talk about things off the field that don't talk to winning that he might have to handle, Javon Baker Zoom. I don't know how much either of you saw that. Making people stand up out of wheelchairs. The first thought <laughs> that hit my head was Bill would have traded his ass oh, for man, a future yeah. fifth as soon as the Zoom was over. <laughs> and, like, Is that something that you're talking about? And this goes to either of you, where it's like, I have to deal with this in a leadership position. You guys have been around other head coaches, even if it's not football. And if so, what was your reaction to to hearing those? It's, it's why I talked about it with Judon on, on my podcast. I, I was like, that's, that. a guy, that's a guy you got to take under your wing 100%. But I, I, I like the confidence, though. He's going to come in motivated. Like he said, uh, he wants to bring the the hard work, the winning mentality back in there. So I think he has the right mindset. I think it was more about, you know, where he got drafted. He thought he should have got drafted higher than what he is. And now that's like the new thing with the kids. Like they, they jump on Instagram live as soon as, you know, as soon as something happens and they, they share their thoughts and feelings versus, you know, in the past, you, you wait till the media calls you, you talk about it, you can do it all by yourself. So yeah, he, he was still fresh asking for drink, where the drinks at and all that. So, you know, he didn't get portrayed in the greatest light, but like I said, you see the videos of him working out against, you know, some of the top corners from the draft and all that. So he's putting in the work. It's all about, you know, when he shows up into the building. I don't think it'd be necessarily a big deal. I'm sure Mayo, I'm sure Mayo have some cooked up for him the day he steps into the building for the team meeting. I'm sure they'll get a, a big kick out of that, especially. Especially if he's not winning some yeah. reps early. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. That first day, like MF and liquor. It wasn't just where the drinks at. It's where the MF and liquor at one o'clock on a Saturday. <laughs> and you, you need they, like they need that. You need. Yeah. I always tell people, James, myself, Slate. We were all a certain way. But the truth is, you can't have a team full of. Why you ain't say me? <laughs> yeah, what's show, up? Oh, just yeah. shows up at my house. Back All up, day. Just walking around, just walking around his big crib, and, and look at it. I like this, man. What's up, James? What's up, Andrew? What's happening? Yo, you're what? interrupting. We're doing a podcast, bro. All right, podcast are free. Yo, now. come on in. Get what did uh, what Jay say about Javon Baker's comments the other day? Oh, I love it, man. You yeah. talk about superior confidence right there. And they're gonna have to tamper them down. Now, who knows though? Males, <laughs> males in office now. They're always out the window. Let them talk with trash. Well, I text Slate. I text Slate right away, and I was like, "Hey, the first thing I thought of when I I heard that was this guy's the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is the only guy <laughs> that was out there healing people, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't walk. Now he's making people walk. I was like, this is awesome. But I think, I think you can't have everybody who's by the book. Like yeah. Jamie yeah. Collins came in. Jamie wasn't by the book. Jamie was a dog for the Patriots, making him play. Like, you need guys to be like that, to have that edge to them. Uh, and it seems like Baker's going to have that. And it seems like they might have got the leader type of guy in Pulp. And now you get to build a room around these guys, hopefully going forward into your future. So um, I liked it. I think receivers need to have a certain level of confidence. They need to be a little crazy. Uh, and, I, like, I'm, I'm anxious to see what you guys say in training camp. Like, right, put them out there and – you gonna have Pep. Pep's gonna be out there yelling and screaming. You're gonna have so it's gonna be interesting to have that dynamic to have those guys with kid with born with KB yelling and screaming. Um, I think that they need that. I think they need that on offense. Some skilled guys that just go out there and compete, but also gonna tell you about it. Uh, so it should be fun to see. I'm so glad you say that. First of all, as the the content creator media member in me, I will I will actually take a team full of Javon Bakers. But the point being that like if you did have that. What makes him special? Or KB, for example, energy he brought in 21 when he first gets there. That stands out because he's a one of whatever in that locker room. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am curious. When you text St. Slate, this is the second coming of Jesus. And it's a 21-year-old <laughs> who had just been in Instagram Live. How did how did that God-fearing man take that tw that text? And how did he respond? We just got emojis flowing back and forth. Dying <laughs> laughing. Uh, like I mean, no fire and brimstone or like fire comments? Because those are very different, but it's the same emotion. <laughs> it was just laughing emojis. And okay. I think that's the that's the thing, okay. right? You draft you draft a young kid who, like James just said. He's excited. He's, he's like, man, all these guys are better than me and comes in with a chip on his shoulder. And then I think the key is to back it up. And I saw James had Judon on and Judon was like, he, he can't walk in with his book bag on, with his head down. Like you said what you said, come in and work your butt off and go go do that. Like we want that. If I'm on defense, 
I'm all for Baker guy making people stand out of their uh, wheelchairs. I'm all for it. That means touchdowns, yards. Let's see it. Let's have it, you know? So should be fun to see. Awesome. All right, let's talk some ball, shall we? Uh, James, when we're making a checklist, and look, to be clear, my OTA's checklist is very different from yours. I am bugging Stacey James every single day. I want Javon Baker, and I want the quarterbacks just to talk every single day <laughs> after practice. But in the times that we used to see you guys at practice, and will now, it just took like once a week or once every 10 days, you know, it's always installs, right? It's, you know, sometimes Texas drills, non-padded stuff, the, the basics all the way down in the classroom. Aside from that, what do you want the Patriots to prioritize and say, if we get only two or three things out of OTAs this spring in minicamp, it has to be, you know, A, B, and C. For me, the number one thing is team building. I know we did a ton of it, you know, when we were there, even though we maintained a lot of the same players on the roster. Now you got new coaches, guys come from all over the place, different players. Make sure you guys are learning about one another, the quarterbacks, learning the offensive coordinators, the quarterback coaches. That That's what matters most, you know. Learn how these guys learn, learn how they, you know, go out there and perform on a day to day basis. I think that's that's huge. And then have fun. And obviously, offensively, they just got to build chemistry. You got a whole new, you know, offensive coordinator, new players coming there, build the chemistry. And it it starts right now in, in OTAs and all that. If you're, you come out BS and bullshitting their OTAs, that shit going to roll over in the training camp and roll over into week one, week two, week three. So, I think it's very important for them to hit the ground running offensively, get sure up that offensive line. You know, you can't really establish like the run game and OTAs and all that, but the fundamentals is making sure the ball's not hitting the ground too many times, getting by, getting everybody up to speed. I think that's really the most important things. And as an offense, especially collectively, they, they have to be on the same page. And like I said, that's, those are the few things that I think are very important for them during mm -hmm. OTA season. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think, I think James hit it. The relationship to me, that's trust. They have to build a trust, not just, you know, for the players on the field. It's the scheme, the system. Like, there's been a lot that's happened in the last few years, especially <laughs> on offense of different coordinators coming in. So you have to build that. You have to build that trust where the player knows what you're telling me. Or if I ask a question, you can fully answer my question. Or you go to Van Pelt and you go to McAdoo, whoever you need to go to as this new system's coming together and you get the right answer you don't tell me something, then he tells me. Like all of those things that can happen on teams, you don't, you don't need that. I think that's the first thing, like James said, that trust. I think they have to – it's boring, but they have to build the fundamentals. You have to have that, I think, on both sides of the ball. I think they need to be able within that trust and the fundamentals. They need to come back together as a team. I think last year was really tough. You heard some defensive players kind of, you know, frustrated after games. Like, I guess we got to hold them – to zero points or we that can't give fault. up. That was AP. <laughs> that was DP straight to me. So if you want to blame anyone. But it was but it was right. It was true. It's offensive. Right? <laughs> we lose a couple games now is six zip is 10 six is 10 seven. That gets frustrating as a defense. So I think you have to have you know that side. I think the third thing for me is, is just compete. Like you want to have competition. James said it, you're not going to have the running game but within the passing game, seven on sevens, all of those things, you want to see everybody compete. Your receiver room is stacked right now. It's a lot of bodies in there. You want to say who's going to compete. Drills on the offensive line. You know Trent Brown's not there anymore, so that's a position. Cole Strange was hurt a lot last year. You had different guys in there. You have kind of Big Mike and Dave coming back as like guys who have played a good amount of meaningful football for you, but other than that, you're trying to find who's going to fill in and be in those other roles. So you want to see that. And I think defensively you have guys coming back, uh, a lot of guys coming back, and you want to just continue to compete. Hey, what we did last year doesn't just roll over into this year. We got to go compete. We got to make the offense better by going and shutting them down every day. Like that yeah. should be your mentality. So um, I think that's what they want to walk away from the spring. Let's stay with the scheme uh, for a second, though, because this was something that came out more this week where uh, Mondre confirmed, hey, we're doing a lot of wide zone. And if you looked at Van Pelt and the Browns, obviously they did some of that after starting as more of a man black uh, gap scheme team. But James, like, I, you know, we, we I looked at the offensive line this offseason like that will be the tell. Is this going to be a gap scheme team? Are you going to stick with the powers <coughs> and counters, et cetera, or pivot to lighter zone team? And they kind of just ran it back. Right. Like, except for Chuck's core for they're going with the same line. What do you make of that scheme fitting the talent that you know, having played with most all of these guys? I like it. It's, it's similar to what San Fran does, outside zones, play action, you know, easy access throws where the quarterback's not holding the ball too long. Uh, outside zone, it's a fun play to run, but 
obviously it has to be blocked correctly. If nobody seals off the edges, nobody cuts off the backside, then you basically just run to the sideline, gaining no yards. So I think you have to build a chemistry offensively with the people next to you on the offensive line, tight ends. It takes everybody on every single one of those plays, receivers too. But I, I like the scheme. I think Ramondre's the perfect outside zone runner. He's a guy who has enough speed to get to the edge. He can put his foot in the ground. You know, make guys miss. And I think it's it's very quarterback friendly, especially for a guy like Jacoby Brissett. And if Drake May ends up playing at some point throughout the season, I think that's a very good scheme to start him off in his career. And then the defensive side. I mean, Deb, you, you face this offense in twenty one. You guys win forty five to seven at home, and then go on the road and beat Jacoby, starting in, in Cleveland. Uh, what do you what do you think of it just from that vantage point? you know, how they marry that outside zone game with the passing game, which seems like it'll be simplified no matter who's playing quarterback. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the challenge is because we, we played against those guys a couple different times and, and we got the best of them that, but we had another game where, you know, tackling Nick Chubb is, you know, <laughs> that, that was, that's a, that's a bit of a problem. And I think. Not for John Jones. Game. You talk about 19 when he raced like 60 yards. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like eight tackles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that's that's a huge part of the scheme. I think what James just said, Ramondre is a, a, a perfect bat for the scheme. And I think that's what it comes down to when you're defending against different teams from a defensive standpoint is, all right, who are they using in this scheme? That's why San Francisco is tough. Like you could talk about their scheme, but it's like, all right, in this scheme, it's going to create a one-on-one -on -one matchup against Christian McCaffrey. All right, we have a guy there to make the play. Yeah. He just makes a miss. So that, like that, <laughs> and I think that's what this scheme will allow you to do: is set up different things with the play action, with the zone, and then maybe throwing in some different gap scheme plays within there. Is create the one-on-one -on -one matchups that you want that are favorable to you, and then go from there. I think the biggest thing for them is you got to be able to win. You know, you got to be able to win outside with all these different things. When you're running the ball and you can run the ball well, the way to stop that as a defense is to say, hey, we're going to go and leave everybody outside one-on-one -on -one because we think we can stop you one-on-one -on -one and stack the box and do different things to take away the time the quarterback has to throw and put the pressure on the receivers versus the DB. So I think that's something that I think they know, like, hey, we got to win those matchups. And I think when we played them that last time, we did a good job of covering their guys. So it made it harder for them to – do the different things in the running game. And we were able to get a play from ahead changes everything, how you can play the game. So I, I like the scheme. It's just, it comes down to execution, like James said, and, and winning those one-on-one -on -one matchups. I love that. It's, I mean, it, it's the truth, but it's also like asking someone like, how well do you speak French? Like, Oh, I know it, but can I speak it? Like that's the execution <laughs> part. There's, it's no good unless exactly. you can say the words. Yep. Uh, okay. So the draft is behind us, but that means the best is still ahead of us. I'm talking playoff games, Celtics, Bruins, and I'll be there covering the Celtics with the Herald. We lost our guy, Steve Hewitt, which brings me to my real point. You want to come with? Because you can find Celtics playoff tickets, lowest price guaranteed at game time, an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets easier and faster than ever. Prices on game time actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. You can find killer last minute deals, all in prices, including those pesky fees, views from your seat, and always, always, always the lowest price guarantee at game time, which takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. And honestly, I've used game time for other games as well. I'm a couple T-stops away from the Sox. If I want to go to a home game, check out on game time, wait outside the gates. It starts, prices go down, boom, I'm in the park five minutes later with the lowest price guaranteed. So you can do this with the Celtics coming up in the second round. We all know they're going to the Eastern Conference uh, Finals. And then hopefully the finals. And you can be there right with them. Last minute ticket deals, flash deals, zone deals, all again, lowest price guarantee, even event cancellation protection, job loss protection, all at game time. So take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets or MLB tickets, all with the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app today. Create a free account and use code CLNS for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, the account is free. Download Game Time, create an account, and redeem code CLNS for twenty dollars off. That's Game Time today. Last minute tickets tomorrow and the lowest price guaranteed let's say you guys are, are back on the team right not not as coaches as i would have if you're on the roster you're eyeing all these rookies we talk about drake may javon baker jalen polk whomever what are the first signs that maybe not definitely but like maybe these kids could help us right away what are you looking for the surest signs that like they they can make an impact early even before you put pads on 
I think limiting mistakes. I think that's the the huge thing. As a young player, there's a lot being thrown at you. You know, you don't want to go out there making the same mistakes every single day when a guy's not making mistakes and he's he's making plays here. He makes a play on one day. Next day, he makes two plays. Mm -hmm. Next day, he's like, okay, this dude, this dude on the – he gets a rest with the first team now. Like, how – you know, you capitalize on your opportunities. I think that's the huge thing as a quarterback, though. I think you want to see them step in the huddle and get control of the offense – the, I can only reference it from Mac Jones. He was the only rookie quarterback to come in and start, you know, from the time when I was there. Just like each week, you're like, okay, like this kid's been a little bit more confidence. He's talking a little bit more in the huddle. He's making some checks that you don't necessarily see a, a rookie quarterback check. Or he's seeing blitzes. He's seeing the coverages. I think that's when you start to build confidence in a ton of these young players. And speaking of OTAs too, like Jacoby Myers, he's a great example. During his OTAs, his his rookie year, like we had Nikhil Harry the same year as him. You know, he came in ready to work. He didn't get many reps. But like each week, he got, he got more and more. Like, okay, this kid starting to make some plays out there. Just sure enough, he's working his way, working with the first team. So I think it's you know constant repetitions and consistency. It's hard to change, even for veteran players. The consistency yep. is extremely hard. So if those guys can come in, limit mistakes, and consistently make plays, I think that's where you're like, okay, this guy deserves to be out there on the field. Yeah, you got, I mean, you got to know what you're doing, and I think that's the the key because that's the way I always look at it as young players. You got to earn the respect from the guys you're going on the field. And my rookie year, that's what I was most nervous about. When I first got in the first team huddle for the first time, I was like, damn, I'm in the huddle. Gerard <laughs> Mayo's making a call. Vince is right. Like, I don't want these guys to look and be like, yo, he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. And you're looking at the staff now, like, yo, we don't want him in here with us if he doesn't know. So I think knowing what you're doing is a big part of it because then you could just go play ball. You got drafted for a reason. There's not like this talent gap of when you get to the NFL, you're just not good enough. No, like you're you're probably good enough. Know what you're doing and then just go play ball. So you can start to see that, I think, right away. Um, I think the athleticism you'll see in drills when you're doing different things, whether it was JC Jackson, whether it was, you know, throughout my career, Alfonso Dinner. Like we had different guys. I remember Deron Harmon missed uh all of spring with an injury, and we got back for early training camp because I had uh shoulder surgery that year. And we got out there and I'm like, all right, dude, as a rookie, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to like tell him a lot of different things when we line up at safety. To roll. And I go to tell him, he's like, oh, no, I'm down. I, I was like, oh, shit. he was studying. Like, yeah. he, he knows what he's doing already. And when you get that and veterans like, ah, oh, I like when this guy's in here with me, I, I can you can start to you can feel a connection to chemistry bill. So, uh, yeah, that's my biggest thing. Just know what you're doing. And if you don't know. I would always tell young players, if you don't know what you're doing and we get out there, tell me, hey, what I got right here. Don't look at me and just <laughs> nod your head. Now, I, I think you know what you're doing. And then we mess up and, you know, we oh, tell me you don't know. I'll, I'll try to help you get right. And then we'll move on from there. And then the next time you get out there, like James just said, I expect you to know what you're doing on that play. You can't not know what you're doing again because then it's like, all right, this guy's not going to be able to help us right away. He's going to have to develop a little bit. Well, that speaks to the trust you mentioned, right? Like building that starts with you got to demonstrate that ability and that 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 earned trust yeah. that you'll have making play after play. Like you'll you guys can tolerate mistakes, but at least know yeah. the why uh -huh. and trust that you knew what went wrong before almost it even happened. So you can go back and go, just fix this next time without having to to backtrack through that. Um now the Packer way obviously is something we've been writing and talking about a lot on my end of things because of Elliot Wolf, things Gerada said, draft and develop, and they're gonna play the young guys. So I want to start with Drake May because I don't know how much you guys have watched. I mean, James, you've been you know covering the Big Ten and part yeah. of their coverage, and Devin, you're you're busy on the weekends, I hear. Uh, but just from this kid, what you've heard, what you experienced with Mac, what would be a fair scenario in which he starts, and where what what signs would you see whether they involve him or maybe the line or the receivers that go, we should probably sit him because I I at least think they're going to give him a chance in the spring and summer to make that decision for them. Yeah, it, it, sh it should be an open competition. It always should be. Nobody should just be handed the starting job. Jacoby will get probably the majority of the majority of the first team reps right away, deservingly so. He's the guy who's you know has the veteran presence. He's played in the NFL. But I think for Drake May, it's just kind of like what I just talked about. Day to day, just just building, mm -hmm. building chemistry with receivers, building the chemistry with the line, building chemistry with the backs, showing some leadership, you know, getting command of the huddle. There's a there's a lot to know, you know, at the quarterback position in the NFL and Every single day, you're going to see a different defense, a different coverage, a different blitz as you've <laughs> never seen in college. And they're going to expect you to know how to handle it, not the, the coach in the booth, you know, telling you, you know, to adjust the play, adjust the, 
you know, the, the blitz scheme and adjust the routes from the receiver. So there's a lot to be learned. It's not saying that he won't or can't beat out Jacoby. It very well can happen. I'm always the biggest fan of, you know, letting these guys sit and, you know, when they earn it, they earn it. Or if the quarterback star quarterback's not performing well, then you throw them in there. Cause we see we we faced a lot of rookie quarterbacks, you know, throughout my time there. And some of these guys never recover from starting their entire rookie season because their their heads just spinning from all the things that they, you know, went out there and failed at early on in their career. Um, but yeah, just build confidence day to day and just learn as much as possible. Be a sponge, ask questions from you know, ask Jacoby, ask you know the receivers, ask the offensive coordinator, stay later, show up early, all that, all that good stuff. Because quarterback's the, the hardest position, you know, in the game of football. And I said, the more you you practice that, the more you rep at it, you'll get better. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think they should let those guys go compete. And I think for Drake May, if, if he's out there and he's doing all the line calls and he's comfortable, he's able to make throws, able to read coverage, then, yeah, I mean, if that's what it looks like in the second or third week in training camp and you're sitting there and you're just like, how can we not play this guy? I mean, we, we, we practiced against Houston back in Deshaun Watson's rookie year. And I remember being out there and him and Tom Savage, and I, I was in school for a year with Savage at Rutgers. And I remember leaving from those joint practices being like, Deshaun Watson's not far off from Savage. Like the way they're reading the coverage, the way seven on seven looked like, I was like, it's, it's not like Savage was out there and the ball was hitting his hands and <laughs> like he wasn't just dissecting and moving. And I was like, once you put in the Deshaun Watson element, I was like, and I think it might have been week one, one to three, where it was like, all right, this game's not going well. Let's put Deshaun Watson in. He gets in, makes some plays, and then he's off and running. So I think I think they're going to have time to see. I think one of the key things is I think they want to just make sure whatever's out there is stable around Drake. Man, I think that one of the hardest things for rookie quarterbacks is when it's not stable around them and then they're ass to not come only do their job, but they're asked to be like that true veteran quarterback. Hey, you know, this guy might be struggling up front. We got to make sure and be prepared that we might have to give him help. So you got to understand when this, like that's a lot to put on a guy. I think yeah. you want to have great stability with your offensive line. You want to know your, your receiver core, who's playing, who's going to be here. What rotation do we have? How comfortable do we feel? The backs who are in there, third down pickup, you want the back to be really good at understanding, to be able to help the quarterback where it's not all on his shoulders. I think that's what happened for Mac in his second year. I think a lot of things kind of went and fell on his shoulders to try to not only get it and, and do it, but to fix things. And when you have to fix things, that makes it really hard as a player. You want to get to a really veteran level understanding of what's going on before you're able to like actually help people fix things and what we used to say out there on the field is kind of like, excuse my language, but un situations. Like that, that's hard to do as a young player. Yeah. And as a producer of this podcast, it needs to enter a bleep at 3418. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a great point because I remember, you know, like, again, these kids get drafted and our job is to dig more about them and learn about them. And one of the tidbits I had heard was not only Mac back then was giving shit to Nick Saban. Uh, it's another bleep on it. Um, what he was, he was telling the left tackle, when he would screw up, hey, you need you need to be better. Like we we will all fall if you do within two seconds there and don't give me enough time to throw. And I feel like that's very different from what you just talked about, right? Because that's accountability, but then there's problem solving while you're also trying to learn. And so I don't want to rehash the whole Mac experience. You guys have both talked about that with me or other people in media um, ad nauseum. But it'll be very interesting to see how quickly Drake can problem solve, if at all, in training camp. And even if he can do those habits of maybe extending plays or scrambling end up hurting him long-term because exactly. his solution is to just run away. And that'll work like four times a game. It's a killer in third down, two-minute drive. We've all seen Patrick Mahomes, plenty of other people do it. But Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's when your you, best pal there, Zach Wilson. <laughs> when you break it yeah. down, I mean, how many times was he just trying to make plays that he was able to do in college? He was able to do that. Drake May was able to do that at, at UNC. I don't care who you bring in. He's probably not going to be able to do that in NFL, and you don't want you don't want to you don't want to learn that that's the way to play quarterback. I think that's the biggest thing. You just don't want to start that habit as a rookie. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to run a theory by you because both of you at least watched or saw. Do you see a little bit of a Bill on McAfee during the draft? 
I was like, that's yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I know the sentiment, like Brewski tweeted this out, like, if you were never in a team meeting, all these pauses are when Bill is dropping F-bombs, or I think, Dev, you might have tweeted, like, this is the this is the real deal. Like, he's holding back a little bit on the criticism. I In listening to Bill drone on in the media, very intensely, very well over the years, I had a theory that whenever he mentioned a quarterback and didn't say anything about accuracy or anything about decision-making, but said so-and-so, like Zach Wilson, in week two, 2021, can make all the throws – that was Bill speak for, I think he sucks because that was a compliment to the media of like, he's so talented. But my point is with this, again, just theory, what does it matter if you can make all the throws in shorts and a t-shirt if you don't know exactly where to put the ball and you don't know when to do it, which is the decision-making part? My if, Is this theory something I've been tweeting for three years and, and just sound like an ass or is there like some substance to this, you think? I mean, it makes perfect sense. There's so much okay. more that goes into it. You can throw the ball 80 yards and make every possible throw, but if you don't know when to make the throw or read a coverage, like who cares? You know, what I mean? so the the mental part of the quarterback position is is more important than anything. You you don't have to throw the ball 100 miles an hour to be able to you know hit a hit a flat route based on the coverage that you're seeing or hit a check down based on the coverage that you're seeing. If you just know what you're looking at pre snap and you confirm it post snap. You, you can you get the ball out of your hands, you know what I mean? So there's so much more that goes into the quarterback position. I don't think, you know, guys should <laughs> be, you know, focus on all the arm talent. The mental thing is number one for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look at – I know Josh Allen still gets criticism of, of decision, but one of the best things he started to do was check the ball down. <laughs> we, we used to play him early in his career, and Bill would say to us, don't guard the check down. Like nobody should be, he's not going. And we would watch clips where he just, he would buy time. He would do, he just wouldn't throw it to the back. Who would be wide open in the flat, could get five to eight, 10 yards, just wouldn't do it. Then he started to be like, all right, if you're going to play zone and stay back and try to keep me in the pocket, I'm just going to do this and we'll move the ball. So I just think that's a big part of playing quarterback. Like any, there's so many talented guys that can play quarterback because they can run fast they can throw the ball hard they have all the like special talent but can he play quarterback and <laughs> that is yet to be seen like we have to watch a guy and figure out can he play quarterback cj stroud can play quarterback like that's he plays quarterback really well and i think when we watch patrick mahomes that's the, the gift of him is if you watch that quarterback documentary and he he throws an interception and right away he's like they're sitting on me he, he like he knew it right away and he knew what the solution was. That to me is quarterback. Yes, he has all the other things that make him a whole nother level, but if he didn't have that aspect, he would just be another talented guy. So the reason I, I brought that up was not to just use your time to just peddle my own theories and see if you can back them up or not. It, it's to it's to note that in his analysis of Drake May during the McAfee show, Draft Spectacular, Bill did exactly that. Makes all the throws, didn't say anything about accuracy or decision making, which isn't to ask you what Bill thinks or what he feels or to ask you to speak for him. But I'm just it, it strikes me as curious because he also highlighted the inexperience, which is just a fact. Like he's made 23, 24 starts. You need to see more in that. But what do you what do you personally feel of a guy that's got that talent? And it sounds like Devin, like the maturity process and the decision making. And James, you brought this up first, actually, will be the check downs. Will that be a sign of progress for whatever you know about Drake May that he's making the right decision? kind of resisting the urge to show off the arm, which we all saw, which Bill talked about, and reinforces those weaknesses of, okay, he's willing to commit to the decision-making part of this, even as a rookie who might be forced into a tough situation. I, I think you can learn it. It's not something that you have to know completely right away. I think that's a part of coaching and developing players, and that's why I say I always lean to the direction of letting these guys sit and learn and, like I said, go against the first team defense throughout practice the entire year. They're going to be throwing all different sorts of things at you. You learn to read all sorts of coverages, blitzes, change of protections. You get more comfortable with it. It's it's not these guys don't have to walk into you know an NFL building and, and know everything. If they do, that's that's great. You can help the team win. I lost CJ Stroud, but that's a you know that's a one off. Not many people are going to walk in you know and take the league by storm. I know everybody's expecting Caleb to do. You know, something like that. He has a great situation around him. Maybe he will. You know, maybe he won't. But for all these guys, it's, it's a learning curve. It's, you don't have to know it now. You can you can fix the footwork. You can fix, you know, reading coverages. It's all about, you know, them learning and willing to go out there and, you know, embrace it. Like I said, you, you can you can escape the pocket sometimes. You can do all the fancy stuff. You can throw it 80 yards down. There's nothing wrong with that. But how consistently can you 
get the coverage right and get the ball out of your hands, you know, in two seconds. I think that's the the number one thing. <laughs> I would be interested too to see um what Bill said about the other quarterback because I didn't pay attention as closely, but I felt like on, on social media right away, like as soon <laughs> as the pick came in and yeah. Yeah. He was like, the guy compares himself to Josh Allen. I don't see that. His footwork is <laughs> – I felt like everybody was like, Bill hates Drake May. He doesn't like – I was like, yo, Bill's been criticizing every single draft pick. He starts off and he says like one or two it – was, it was a team meeting. I was like, he says a couple of things they do well, and then it was just like, but if they don't do this, they don't do that, they got to do this. So I, I just felt like he was very authentic, and I, and I loved it from a fan standpoint of – I don't really know what I'm watching when I watch the quarterbacks. Like I, I don't fully understand that. Yeah. So now as I watch these guys and I can try to remember back to what Bill said, if I'm a fan of the bears or I'm a fan of Washington or, or new England, and I'm watching these picks that we just got in the top three, I now should be vividly remembering, okay, Belichick said his footwork sloppy. All right. The, the commentator, the broadcaster, my show and the replay of like his toe was pointed the wrong way. Like, dang, Bill kind of said that. Hey, Bill might have said about Jaden Downs. He'll have to figure out when to tuck the ball and run, when to stay in the pocket. And oh man, like I remember. So that to me was a unique thing about having Bill on there and not just saying, this guy's great. He does this. He does <laughs> but actually going and having cut ups and film ready of this is what this guy does really well. This is why he's the number one, two, three pick in the draft. But this is also what this guy's going to need to do to be successful in the NFL. Um, and I think that's what he kind of put out there for Drake May. But I thought it was cool because he put it out there for every single player um, that got drafted and whenever he had the cutups ready for him. Yeah, and that's that's totally fair, right? Like, what does it matter if it's removed from the context? You know, this wasn't analysis in a vacuum. It was specific to Drake May, but it's within the context of a show. If he was, you know, same balance, negativity, positivity with every prospect – well, then that's just how he did it for everyone. It wasn't unique to to, to Drake. Uh, it also speaks to the authenticity part, right? Like, I think you guys have both succeeded well in your, your post-playing careers because there are guys who just want to get up there and compliment their old teammates or coaches or not. You know, they fall back on the old media training habits. And Bill was like, no, F it. I'm going to tell you what I think. So yeah, that's you, that's why I caught a real look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we care about what he thinks and what he feels because he's exactly. the smartest guy in the room wherever he walks. Uh, two quick ones, though, and I'll, I'll get you out of here. Speaking of the authenticity part, I need a, a just a good OTA story. And this might be like not a scale of one to 10 because they're OTAs and they're not padded. It might be like one to five. So I'll take like a fine average, but just one year of practice that made you laugh or someone stood out or, okay, this might be a problem. Just, just something you remember around this time of year that ended up being a little more meaningful than you could have known at the time. Um, I say for myself, my rookie year, I, I remember when I first got to Foxborough, I don't think there was sun at all that entire OTAs. It was just <laughs> raining and gray, you know, outside. And, and one of the practices, it was, it was it was raining out there. I was, you know, me and Shane, I think a bunch of the backs were like banged up. Me and Shane were repping and all that stuff. I, I probably slipped during practice at least at least three or four times. And and everybody that plays with Bill knows he, he loves it when it's, it's raining outside because you're going to, if you slip, you're going to be on the highlight clips. And I was I was on there in a team meeting like, at least like three times, slipping all over. I mean, look, you can't – you're cutting on the outside edge of your inside foot. You can't stand up. The, the, you're no good on the ground. We can't complete a pass. The, the. So he he was ripping me. And then, like, I vividly remember – I think we might have been – it might have been seven on seven. Like, Tom was trying to complete a pass to Jules or something across the field. And, like, Jules slipped trying to catch it. He's like, we got our two supposedly best players. We can't complete an effing pass on air. I mean, what the – you know, like he just that, that type of we thing. You can go to Fox yeah. or high. Yeah, yeah. Guys that can throw that yeah it, it's just hilarious. It, it just let me know early that everybody, everybody's, you know, you know, getting held accountable, not just you know, me as a rookie. So that's that's one that stuck with me. Don't don't slip when it's raining. <laughs> if you slip, you will be on the low lights, no matter what. Um, for me, I always thought you OTAs and stuff was like it was a good, I always told guys. It's a good beginning to learn, and you should try to learn as much as possible. Because, like, what I always remember about OTAs is there's always a bunch of guys who dominate OTAs. You guys write about them nonstop. <laughs> this guy's phenomenal. And, like, I used to always be like, no one cares. It's so irrelevant <laughs> other than do you know what you're supposed to do so when real football starts, you can go do that. Because, like, I watch guys come and train into OTAs and have – 
some of the best OTAs. And I was like, I was going to start this year. And then second week in training camp, it's like, this guy's still on the team? I mean, he hasn't done <laughs> anything. So, um, yeah, I, I, I thought OTAs was exactly what James explained earlier. It was a great time to laugh and joke. Like, I still remember uh, it might have been my rookie year to be done with mini camp, OTAs, all of that. We come out and we do a relay race. It's, um, it's uh, Brandon Dedrick, Kyle Love, uh, Vince, and Gerard Warren. This is the, the four by 100 team. <laughs> and it's like, you guys got to run under, I want to say maybe it's like 49 seconds, for, something like that. And that will get us and we'll be done for practice. And now you're sitting there, you're like, damn, like, how's this going to go? <laughs> and uh, Gerard Warren, we call him money. Money starts it off, comes out the gate. And I'm like, oh, big boy's rolling. Big dude, yeah. Gives it to Dedrick. Dedrick runs. And then the last two, Kyle and Vince, are like, that's the word you're like, I don't know. <laughs> and they get this baton. And I mean, love rolls and then Vince gets it and Vince just strides it out and they run like maybe two seconds faster than <laughs> the time. And everybody goes nuts. We're done. We're done for the spring off till training camp. And like that to me was a cool, just kind of introductory. All right, this is what the NFL is like. Great bonding time. Nobody really cares how many balls you caught or how many interceptions you got. Just come back and do it when real football starts. But that to me was like James said, if you could have a good session and a good spring, it just carries you over into training camp. It's a good feeling about you. You just didn't want to have too many days where Bill came in and was just like, this is bad, guys. This is bad football. We're dropping balls. Like You're going to have some of those days, but you just don't want a majority of those days going into training camp. Right. Yeah. Growth might not be linear, but if over yeah. all the days you have more good days and bad, you know, exactly. you kind of trust, trust that guy. Um, is there a position? Because when you start thinking like this guy crushed OTAs and the media is loving up on him, I first think of receivers. Now, yeah, a defensive one, guy might one. say, don't pay attention <laughs> to the receiver. But is that kind of what you're talking about? Like, yes. it doesn't matter until they get jammed in the second week of practice. And I mean, 2022, how many how many deep balls did we complete in practice at OTA? Yeah. Oh, we're, they're going to throw the ball down the field this year. This is going to be electrifying. <laughs> It was like, where's shorts and a t-shirt? Like, <laughs> guys are making one-handed catches, and and it was just like, uh, let's take it easy on these guys. Like, let's guys are told in practice, like, let's not dive on receivers' legs. Let's stay up. And it was like, we always get like three receivers every spring that are going to be like first team all pros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, de it's definitely receivers number one. I, yeah. I, I'll tell you firsthand, we had countless guys that show up during OTAs have a field day and then training camp comes around you have the the physical part of football gets implemented and they kind of disappear to make a play here or there and you know that's about it so yeah number one is the receiver that's their time to shine though during OTAs you can't touch them you know they're throwing the ball 99 percent of the time so you're gonna get a ton of opportunities to make plays yeah, and those twitchy edge guys. Like Josh Uche, I think, has yeah. seven sacks a day. Yeah, that, that my, too. My yeah, edge guys. <laughs> well, I always <laughs> laugh because those guys will be – they'll all complain. And I would tell them, I'm like, you guys set the tempo. If the defensive line slows down, then the offensive line will come. I said, you guys complain about each other, and then you all go out there and you block each other and you <laughs> rush like we're in full pads. I said, and then the head coach has to come in and literally tell everybody, hey, we got to take it easy. I said, the coach is telling y'all to take it easy. That's not supposed to happen. But And I think that's a newer thing. When I first got in the NFL, OTAs were a joke for the line. They, <laughs> they would take two steps, three steps, and just stop. And that would be it. And Vince would tell me. He'd be like, man, these guys doing all that right now. It don't matter. We'll see what they do when I when I stick my hands in their throat. Or I feel like, <laughs> and like, that to me, I was like, that's a, that's a real defensive lineman. Like, he's telling you, I don't care. Like, Logan Mankins wasn't blocking people hard in OTAs. Yeah, when training not. camp came, yeah. he was killing you. Like that's yeah. that's the mentality of those guys. That the, the rest of the stuff is nowadays is like, all right, the media is here today. I want to make sure they write something good about me. <laughs> like, that's the difference, I think. Everybody that's has the first mistake G giving a crap about what we think. But I uh, I get it. It sounds like permission for me to take a daiquiri to my first like OTA practice. Just gotta sit back. <laughs> hey like, man, you do what you gotta do to keep yeah. getting those paychecks. Yeah, man. It's hard to buy. It's hard to evaluate, honestly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> All right, we'll get you out on this real quick. Uh, 
you know, we talk a lot about Drake. We talk about the receivers. We're going to talk about all those players we just mentioned in OTAs because that's how that's the calendar. That's that's what we do this time of year. Who's a player that each of you think for the Patriots? Not getting a lot of love now. Probably won't in the next month or two. That has a real chance to kind of break out in a way that's genuinely surprising. Not 12th in the list of 20 players who could break out this year, but like actually can do it. And we're not really talking about. That's that's tough. To, uh, somebody that I think I know Des yeah, got not, not he big followed player. you around like a puppy for all of his rookie season Ooh. and got hurt last year. So we're not talking about him. I mean, so I, I, I do think he's one of the guys. You, you, that go, you, go, for, you go, you go first. I, think, I, th- I do. I think Marcus Jones is a guy that kind of has been forgotten. Um, even like I saw so many people like the Patriots should draft Cooper DeGene because his return ability. And I'm like, well, Marcus Jones is like a, like two years ago was, you know, he's an unbelievable returner. He was like second team or first team all pro or something. I was like, he's pretty good. Like he's going to be healthy this year. So I just think, I think it's going to be interesting how their corner situation works out. Who starts opposite Gonzalez? Do they want John Jones to still play outside? And is that free up Marcus Jones and now start in the slot? Um, so he's a guy I've, I've always been a fan of. It. I think he's one of those young guys that I could tell right away he was hurt. He knew everything. He was asking questions. So you just knew, like, all right, well, we'll see when he gets out there. And then when he got out there, it was like, oh, this guy's twitchy. He's fast. Yeah, and then once he got out there with pads on and you were like, oh, he likes tackling. I mean, he's <laughs> hitting people. I was like, oh, this guy has a chance to be a pretty good football player. So I am. I'm excited to see him and. I think the other guys, I, I want to see Doug take that next step to being one of the best players at his position in the league. Because I think, I think between him and Pep being there, I think they're going to have they have a chance to have one of the best tandems in the league. Um, they just got to continue to be consistent. And we James talked about earlier. I think those two guys have special abilities to have those plays that are like wow. So I think if they could just do, could like just have a straight line of consistency and then the splash play consistent splash play i think they have they make they have a chance to make their defense special just having those two guys be elite studs this year for them under the radar player for me i'm going to limb i'm gonna say my guy tyquan thornton just because he's Ooh. i know they have a very deep receiver room different body types but he's the one guy that's you know sets that's himself right. apart as far as the speed you got a new offensive coordinator you know new head coach and everything so you get a fresh start clean slate you know, heard he put on a put on a little weight. You know, my dog wasn't you know <laughs> probably like 160 soaking wet. Yeah, so he put on a few pounds. So I want to see him come out here compete because he's he's not just fast. He he has the quickness. He can get in and out of his breaks. That's something I tried to stress to him for the little bit of time I was there. When I'm like, dude, like when you step in front of somebody, like they're gonna fear your speed, but you can get in and out of your cuts. You know, you know, you're not Tyree Hill, but you know you can get out in, in and out of your cuts well enough to you know threaten all these guys run any route you want. So. I, That'll be my under the radar guy, a guy who's not so under the radar. I think Hunter Henry's going to have a big year this year. David and Joku had a huge year, like almost 900 yards last year under Alex Van Pelt. So the, the tight end position is going to be used pretty heavily. Hunter, I know he got banged up some last year, but he's he's a mismatch. You know, when he when he's on, he's a, hard, a tough guy to stop. He's a tough guy to bring down. So I think he's a guy that'll have a big year for this offense. And Ty yeah, had a good game in 2021 against Cleveland. Yeah. I think he had two touchdowns in that game. So, so I'm sure the coach seen that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. When KB got hurt at the start yeah. of that, took that yep. jet sweep that I think was for KB yep. and then goes mm-hmm. in. He's um the official weight because I checked in on this the other day, up to 188. So uh, I don't think he's stepping in the ring anytime soon with the heavyweight division. <laughs> that's, that's solid though for receiver. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Especially this day him, and like, age. He, he, was, he was slim, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, up from like about 180, maybe even less after some of those training camp practices when you guys are quitting out five, six pounds a day. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. I, I like both those picks. Um, not that you care about what that says, but Hunter Henry, too, people forget, was like viable fantasy option the way he was yeah. scoring at the start of last year. Philly, <laughs> Miami, uh, not against the Jets, but as the season wore on, was just like red zone target, third down, and was the only guy getting doubles. Uh, until Pop Douglas. But, uh, yeah, I think he'll bounce back. I think those are good picks. And football will uh, be here soon enough, even if – Who uh, you got? Who you got? Who you got? Who I got? Yeah. Uh, It's a good question. I might have to tease it for next episode. No. Um, (laughs) That's well done by you. I I think I'm going to go Daniel Quale. Uh, People forget that he's a guy that, like, on a per-snap basis is going to get his – gets hurt last year contract year for him he's a bit older 
But like that interior push, him and, and Barmore, like mm-hmm. I think with Barmore getting more doubles, he could get f- five, six, seven sacks this year. I yeah. like it. I when like you see Barmore in the locker room, tell him to send me the Dior <laughs> shirt that he wore. I want a free Dior <laughs> shirt. <laughs> You know what he's going to be doing? He's going to be doing that meme with just a stack of dollar bills. Yeah. I can't hear you. So I'm not doing media today. I'm just turning around. Like, it's just going to be more. I can't hear you. All right, Devin McCourty, James White, still the best, even in retirement. Uh, James, drop the name of your pod. Anything you're doing, Devin, do the same afterward. Yes, sir. Make sure you guys check out the Money Down podcast. We're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. Got a giveaway going on right now for a signed football. So make sure y'all enter that. And now I'm on Big Ten Network as well and Series X. Man's <laughs> yeah, doing everything, man. He's a working man right there. And he's a husband and a father. I'm not doing anything. I'm just a guy for right Daddy daycare down in New Jersey when you're yeah, not coming up. That's what I'm about to go do right now. Pick up the kids from school. <laughs> well, uh, stop coming to Celtics games. I saw you at game two. The only game they lost to James is Miami Heat. I promise, James, we wouldn't talk about the Heat. But Blame, That's all right, man. Blame Mr. Mr. Crap. I was supposed to come home. He invited me to the game. You don't say no to RKK. Okay, can I invite you? You go. That's true. Oh, are we going to see you guys for Tom's uh, celebration, you think, the, the 12th? Yeah, I'll okay. be there. All right, cool. <laughs> we'll definitely be there. Yeah, all right, good. We'll see you there. Thanks again, guys. Still the best. Later, right, guys. Good to see you. All right, wrapping up as we do once a week here with the Mail Fan segment. Jordan Boss is back. Do, uh, still a George tester, yeah? Yep, still in the dot. Excellent. So Jordan uh, has a question, which, as you know, if you've been listening to this segment, first of all, He's asking that question because he donated to Boston Children's Hospital. Second of all, I'm going to read him his own question, and then let him answer his own question, and then I will uh, go on from there. And I think it's a good one because you DM me actually last week, and we ran out of time around the draft, which tends to happen. Um, but I think we, the new one puts us looking forward in a manner that's not quite training camp, but before we get to surprise cuts, you've got Patriots veterans who are on notice. So you asked exactly that. Which Patriots veterans got put on notice after the draft? And your answer would be what? I mean, I think it's a couple for sure. I think you look at, they attack the quarterback room, the receiver room, and the offensive line. And I think those positions are the most competitive positions on this team. And I think those are the ones that are under under fire right now. So you look at it, Juju Smith-Schuster, I just don't see him making the team at all. I think that's just going to be, you know, I think they're going to look for a trade partner. I think they're just going to cut him. You know, you look at all the videos in like Instagram stories that have come out the past, like, two, three weeks about like, um, like, like everyone, like pop Douglas, Osborne, Kendrick Bourne, like you don't see Juju out there. You know what I mean? I know he's older, but like, I don't know if you can even play anymore. Like that might even end up being like a retirement potentially, but I think he's on the hot seat. Take one Thornton. I mean, it's year three. You got to put up some numbers, but I don't think he's even going to get that opportunity. Um, I think Bailey Zappi, I almost don't even want to say his name because <laughs> that's such an obvious, like you're just going to trade him for a seventh round pick and, 2030 or something like that because you know joe milton's getting those third team reps bailey's that sounded getting. personal for a second like bailey had it's dated just, an ex-girlfriend of yours i'm glad you pivoted to something bailey more Zappi, professional it's the bailey zappy fans it's just like come on now um like everyone that said like oh draft zappy or draft marvin harrison jr and start zappy i'm like do you do you want to make everyone upset <laughs> that was <laughs> but, that was the thing i must have missed that it, sadly it was yeah it's like the following part of twitter where it's like not for you it's whatever um, but I think it's I think it's Zappy, Juju, Thor, and then I think it's the guards. I think it's everyone that Belichick drafted. I know that you and Doug said this last week where it was like, hey, maybe Elliot Wolf doesn't like um Mafi or um Jake Andrews, or maybe Cole Strange, they're like, you know what, you're just you've been undersized for the last three years and you're injured every year and we don't trust it. So I think the guards, I think Juju, Taekwon, and I think Zappy are the ones that are most likely to uh be on notice. I think that's spot on. And when you hone in specifically on the draft, right? Seven out of those eight draft picks were on offense. That means they're going to replace some guys who are currently on offense. And I think you hit the right names. Bailey Zappi is a trade candidate. You've got five quarterbacks in there. Like that is, as I wrote the other day, violating some fire codes, probably in Gillette Stadium. Uh, Juju just doesn't make sense. This is a team that's following the Packer way, which mandates after you get younger, you then play the kids. And so even if that's not, uh, Tyquan Thornton, it'll be Jalen Polk or Javon Baker. And then after them, it would be a guy who's in his second or third year, a la Tyquan Thornton, not Juju Smith-Schuster, who by all accounts is, is pretty washed. I will throw one more name in there, uh, specific to the offensive line, because you hit the right ones. Jake Andrews, Tony Amafi, City Sal. Cole Strange, 
is another one to watch for me. Now, obviously, they would need a replacement at left guard. But you'll remember that back in that 2022 draft, all of us going WTF. Like that was one of the first episodes we had done in this podcast. We all saw a left guard out of Chattanooga. I don't know exactly who would replace him, but Nick Leverett was one of their later signings in free agency. Again, it was a backup in Tampa Bay. But if they feel comfortable enough, this new regime with him, that's basically not just a receiver, a quarterback, and an offensive lineman. That's the whole 2022 draft around <laughs> Marcus Jones is the only one left. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's something where it's like, because I didn't think about this. I was like, why are they drafting more interior linemen? We have enough of those guys. And these guys, doesn't they don't sound maybe Wallace, but they don't sound like that they're projecting at a tackle position. Um, like Layden Robinson doesn't sound like he's going to be a tackle. Um, but then you're like, well, it's because Elliot Wolf was probably in that draft from being like, I cannot wait to get my shot because these guys are out the door. So for me, it's like, you know what? They're starting fresh, which I really like. I mean, I would have loved them to get a number one wide receiver. I feel like everyone's, you know, get me IU, get me one of these guys. And I really want to know what that asking price was. You know, there's no way they wanted the third pick of the draft for one of these guys. But I mean, I really wanted one of those guys. But now that they're not getting that, I think they pivoted to, all right, we're going to play the young guys. And obviously that means Juju's out the door for sure. Yeah. And I looked on defense because I wanted to have a a non-obvious answer for you. But at some point when you're looking at a roster where, you know, in a couple months, everyone on the beat is going to do their 53-man roster projections. It's not going to quite be a circle on top of a circle, but it'll be a Venn diagram where there's very little space on the outside of as far as what I wrote versus what Mark Daniels wrote versus what, you know, anybody else in the beat wrote. So it's interesting to kind of follow. Defensively, though, I would say, again, guys that you're targeting who might be a little bit older or at positions with better depth. And they added Marcel Style, who I don't know if he's going to um, necessarily play right away. He's a six-round pick. Most six-round picks get cut. But some of the backups near him, you know, Sean Wade, I think, has run out of lives uh, as the fifth corner on this team. <laughs> uh, Alex Austin's in there. But, like, how much pressure on a guy that, you know, knows he has to earn his job every single year anyway? And then the linebacking core is what it is. So it's it's difficult to find. I think they've got the right pieces in place. But your, your, your mindset is the right place. It's guys on offense. And then it's guys who are going to age out faster than not. Um, and if they don't make a trade, though, as far as Juju or Zappi goes – I'll be fine with that so long as they meet kind of a roster cut deadline, right? Like you can have more competition in camp. If Juju's got anything, might as well bring the best out of him or try to do that now. Or are you in a rush to deal either him or Zappi? Yeah, I mean, I just, I don't want to see Juju on the field. Like, because like you mentioned, like this year, they're not going to be successful this year. I mean, knock on wood, you know, but they're not going to be a team. So I want to look at the end of this season and say, all right, Drake is the guy, right? Or Drake is progressing. Or, hey, Pop had a great year to jump from his rookie season. Or, what? no, hey, Kendrick Bourne looks back. Or Devon Baker looks like a true, you know, beast out there. Whatever it's going to be. So Juju is kind of pointless, right? You know, it's almost like the Denver win last year. It's like, this was a pointless win. We got nothing from this. Like, Juju on the field, you know, if if he scores a touchdown from Jacoby Brissett, does that help the 2025 Patriots? Not even close. It probably hurts them, right? So... For me, I want him out the door. One thing I, I was reading earlier today, um, I think they just signed Joey Sly's kicker. So maybe yep. hot seat, Chad Ryland. You know, if you if you have another shaky camp, I'm just getting rid of you. Or, you know, pick the next guy that's in the uh, USL, FL, or whatever the new fo- XFL is called. Like, pick the number one kicker from that league and bring him over. So I think he might be on the hot seat, not just of the draft, just because you had a horrible year last year. And kickers are one of those. It's like, I always said kickers in the NFL are almost like fantasy defenses. Or kickers, it's like you're going to take one or two, and then after that, just if someone's on a buy, just replace them. Like it's ride the hot hand. <laughs> it's interesting too because Sly filled the last open roster spot they had, and they have rookie minicamp coming up, which just gets way into the weeds, right? Like I think most football fans are washing their hands uh, right now, unless you have a dynasty draft or something, and say, "I will see you in July when there's more <laughs> football to be reported on and actual practices going on." But I would say is those rookie mini camps are not just for the draft picks. It's not for Drake May. Hey, play catch with Jalen Polk and Javon Baker. It's for dudes like once upon a time, Malcolm Butler, come take a flyer. Gunnar Oshevsky, come take a flyer. Visit. If you impress us, you can get a roster spot. And the Patriots, at least now, are confident enough that if that happens, and again, it does often enough where you keep extending these invites to other players who didn't get drafted or signed since, that they would have to cut someone. And of course being a team coming off of a 4-13 season. Like, there are guys to cut. But mm. to me, it, ex- it it expresses a confidence in the roster from the regime as it is now that, that might be a little bit higher than what we have in the outside, which doesn't mean they're right. Patriots were more confident than most of us were on the outside, even those of us who said they might go 9-8, and 10-7. Uh, mm. But it's, it's an optimism that I think 
they know and believe, at least in their young guys. So we just haven't seen a whole lot of it. And those are the guys we're going to see a lot more of going forward. Yeah, and just preaching the the competition side of it that Wolf and, and Mayo have preached the past couple, definitely the last couple of days, I think ever since Mayo got here, I think it's one of those things that kind of puts every every veteran on noticing, hey, like, it's a competition. It's not how much money you're making, because think about it, for the most part, none of these guys got any money from Mayo or Elliot Wolf, besides, like, Unwainu and Kyle Duggar. So, besides those guys, they feel pretty good, but, you know... Um, yeah, you know, name any. I mean, Juju's a great example because he got paid and he's been horrible. But like Devontae Parker was one of those guys where it's like, hey, we didn't give you this contract. We have no problem cutting you or trading you to the Eagles for a bag of balls. So I think that competition line really kind of shows you, hey, like whether you're an undrafted free agent, seventh round pick, you know, tight end, whoever it's going to be, like you have to work to make this team and get some playing time, which I love. All right, one last note, and we'll get you out of here. And this is uh, putting you on the spot a little bit. Is you know. And day three of the draft, Elliot Wolf and Drod Mayo called and involved Drake May in a way that was like, hey, here's what we're thinking. Here's who we like. What do you think? Which just shocked me. <laughs> like, it back further into my seat than I ever expected. Because, first of all, of course, that's as far away from Belichick. Uh, roster building philosophy, as you will find. Second of all, May has not taken a snap yet. And he's already being, quote, unquote, involved to a small degree in these decisions. So I would say, Jordan. As someone who is uh, new on this podcast, if you were to be involved in the roster making, building decisions in this podcast of guests to come up, who would you like to see as the Drake May to my Elliot Wolf and Gerard Mayo come on as we build out this podcast? Guests in the next couple of weeks as I start to have a draft here uh, further into the offseason. I mean, I mean, it's a pretty long list. You know, you could go current players, former players, coaches, whatever it's going to be. Um, for me, I mean, someone, I mean, I'll think, uh, you know, Tom Brady, I mean, you know, probably not going to happen. I would love to get, I don't know what his name is. It's the receiver's assistant coach that came over from Washington. I think he was quality control coach with Washington, or maybe he was receiver's coach. Uh, he's quality. Yeah, I'd love to get him on because not only is he going to tell us, you know, what does he want out of receivers, but give us some Jalen Polk, you know, background, give me his background. So he's one of those guys where I'm like, you had some influence on that pick with Jalen Polk. You're, you're going to be here. That's probably the, the heaviest position that we're looking at. Like, going into camp, we're looking at receivers. Like, that's and obviously Drake May. But, like, that connection is going to be so important. So, I'd like to get him on. Let's see how. Let's see what he has to say. I think Tyler Hughes would be honored to be on this podcast. I've never <laughs> spoken to him one-on-one -on -one in person. He was not here last year. He was uh, a grunt in 2022 as a guy who's even been a head coach at the high school level and I think small uh, college level. But we will get to know Tyler Hughes a lot more. I don't I don't expect he will be on, but we, uh, we might make a phone call or two. Who knows? It's a whole new era. Yeah. New I mean, I, he's, he's probably pretty free. Like, you know, I don't think he's going to get the Tom Brady roast in a couple of days. So I think uh, I think he'd be someone that, you know, it would be one of those, all right, like, let's see what you have to say kind of guys. Yeah. All right, Jordan, thank you for donating to Boston Children's Hospital. Thank you for coming back on the podcast, and thank you for uh, participating here. A couple of questions, one of yours and one of mine here as we wrap up another Mail Fan segment. Of course, happy to be on.